Stanford University. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Larry Kramer. I'm the dean at the law school, for those of you who don't know, because one of the things that I'm really delighted to see is uh, that not everybody here is from the law school. Um, and it's great to see alumni from all across the campus to, to come. Each year, the law school hosts, during alumni weekend, one university-wide panel. Um, and as I'm Hopefully you've read it from the, uh, the programs that are on your chairs. For today's panel, we've got some of the most well-respected and knowledgeable uh, environmentalists in the country. Um, so uh, this panel, the, I, I, I will say, I will confess, the, pan, the idea for this panel, we developed it during the summer because you have to plan far ahead. And at the time, of course, they were telling us that the oil would still be leaking. Uh, now, fortunately, that prediction turned out to be wrong, um, but of course, the consequences both in the immediate uh, arena are still being played out, and of course, the larger public policy issues and questions that are raised um, by events like the oil spill in the Gulf um, will go on for a long time and remain important across a whole array of issues and problems that we'll be facing. So we've got a panel for you today with leading experts from government, from the academy, and from the private sector uh, to talk to you about this. Um, my colleague Buzz Thompson is actually going to do the honors of introducing the individual panelists, so I'm just going to introduce Buzz and then get out of your way. Um, so let me just say a few words about, about Buzz. Buzz um, is a member of the undergraduate class here at Stanford of 72, and he received his JD MBA uh, from the law school and the business school in 1976. Um, he's presently the Robert E. Paradise Professor of Law and Director of the Environmental and Natural Resources Law and Policy Program at the law school, or ENRLP. Um, his scholarship on environmental issues focuses uh, on the future of endangered species and fisheries, uh, on the use of economic techniques for regulating the environment, and on a whole lot of other things. And, and I will say the unique thing about Buzz is the academy is filled with people who are very brilliant, and it's also filled with people who are very knowledgeable. Um, and those two things, of course, as you know, are not always the same. Um, it's not necessarily filled with people who are brilliant and knowledgeable and also have a lot of sense. Um, which is really what it takes to do the very best kind of scholarship. Uh, Buzz is one of those people, however. Um, his university citizenship, partly as a result of that, extends beyond the law school, and he is also the Perry L. McCarty Director of the Woods Institute for the Environment, um, and he co-directs the university's initiative uh, on the environment and sustainability. And so uh, Buzz is one of the leaders of all of the university programs across all of the schools and departments, on environment, on sustainability, um, and on climate change, and so on. The Woods Institute is really the hub for the university's overall effort in environmental research, education, and policy. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce Buzz, who will moderate today's panel and ask the questions and guide everything. Buzz. Thank you. So is the, it sounds like the mic is working. Um, that was a very nice introduction, Larry. I always worry a little bit when uh, Larry in particular starts out with something like, you know, the university is populated by people who are very smart uh, and people who are really knowledgeable that the next line is going to be, but Buzz is neither of those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have a great panel today uh, to talk about the Deepwater Horizon uh, explosion and oil spill of earlier this year. Uh, I think you all know the facts at this particular point in time. It was an oil spill that lasted three months. It started on April 20th of this year and lasted for a total of 87 days until July 15th of this year. Uh, the official governmental estimate of how much oil was dumped into the Gulf of Mexico is 127 million gallons during that period of time. Uh, there are independent estimates that put the number as high as 185. Uh, million gallons. Uh, given uh, bars of estimates, those are probably actually overlapping. Uh, but the bottom line, it was a hell of a lot of oil. Uh, and uh, the BP oil spill ranks as the largest accidental oil spill 
uh, in world history. Uh, so we're talking about a very major event. And to shed some light on this particular event, we have the, uh, uh, one of the dream panels, uh, a panel which it is my pleasure to be able to, uh, uh, to moderate. And I'm going to introduce people in order of seniority in terms of when they graduated from Stanford Law School, because all four of the panelists uh, today are Stanford Law School graduates. Uh, the first in order of uh, seniority, I can do this only because I graduated before any of them uh, even started law school. Uh, but the, uh, the first is David Hayes, uh, who was a graduate of Stanford Law School in uh, 1975. Uh, David uh, was the uh, global chairman of the Environment, Land, and Resources Department at the firm of uh, Latham and Watkins. Uh, but even more important than the period of time that he has spent as a uh, practicing lawyer, David has uh, served in two Democratic administrations in Washington, D.C. He was the uh, Deputy Secretary of the Interior during the Clinton administration, uh, and then the Obama administration was able to convince him to come back and be Deputy Secretary of the Interior uh, again today. Uh, David is as knowledgeable as anyone that I know on the subject of uh, natural resources. In addition to the period of time that he spent in uh, government, Probably most importantly to me, he was a consulting professor at the Woods Institute for the Environment here before he went back uh, into government. Uh, so I'd like you to start out by welcoming David Hayes. The second panelist, and some I've had the pleasure of, uh, uh, of having on prior panels, is Dan Riker. Dan was law school class of 1983, and he's now the director of climate change and energy initiatives at google.org. Uh, he has had experience in every sector uh, of, uh, uh, of society. He has uh, been in government during the Clinton administration. He was Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy in the Department of Energy. He has been involved in the uh, uh, private nonprofit sector uh, in a wide variety of positions, but in particular as senior attorney at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And he's also had experience in the private sector as co-founder of the New Energy Capital Corporation. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I think is most important on his resume, however, is that Dan is an avid kayaker, uh, and he was uh, part of the first team that kayaked the entire 1,888 miles of the Rio Grande River, and after that, he was part of the first team to kayak the entire Yangtze River in uh, China. So if you can join me in welcoming Dan Riker. Next is Meg Caldwell. Meg is the uh, uh, Stanford Law School class of uh, uh, 1985. Uh, and Meg, you've been back here now for about 18 years, I think, uh, heading up the environmental and natural resource law and policy uh, uh, program here at Stanford. But in addition to the work that she does here on the uh, Stanford Law School faculty, uh, she has taken time to be chair of the California Coastal Commission, uh, to serve on the board of the California Coastal Conservancy, to be part of the Blue Ribbon Task Force for the Marine Life Protection Act here in uh, uh, California. Uh, and most important again to me, she is the executive director of the Center for Ocean Solutions, which is an interdisciplinary program which we run with the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute uh, down in uh, Monterey. Meg is also an avid kayaker. Uh, I don't think she's ever kayaked the entire Rio Grande and Yangtze uh, uh, River, but one of the things that's a little known fact is that she was on the cover uh, of the Southern Debutante magazine uh, with uh, uh, her kayak and the title Water Woman. So <laughs> join me in welcoming Water Woman uh, to our panel. And then finally, our, uh, our last panelist uh, is Debbie Sevis. Debbie is the class of 1987, and one of the things I'm proudest of here is that Debbie was one of the first students that I taught uh, when I returned here to Stanford Law School uh, to teach in the environmental law area. Uh, Debbie, again, has a very varied and distinguished career. She was an attorney at Heller Ehrman uh, in San Francisco. She was an attorney with the Earth Justice Legal uh, Defense Fund. Uh, she currently serves as the chair of the board of directors for the Turtle Island Restoration uh, Network. 
uh, but probably most importantly for all of our purposes, she directs uh, the environmental clinic here at Stanford Law School. So each year, uh, she has uh, scores of Stanford Law School students who she supervises in handling major environmental cases, including cases before the United States uh, Supreme Court. Uh, and recently, uh, she received a uh, uh, endowed chair. She is now the Luke W. Cole Professor of Environmental Law and the Director of the Environmental Law Clinic. So I'd like you to join me finally in welcoming Debbie. So with those quick introductions, uh, we're going to try a little bit different of a format on this particular panel. Rather than having people speak for a long period of, um, uh, of time, we're going to start out with each of the panelists taking about two minutes uh, to give some initial thoughts on the uh, BP oil spill. Uh, and then after that, I will actually engage the panelists in a um, uh, discussion for about half an hour. And then after that, I'm going to turn it all over to you to ask the questions that are either on the top of your mind or that um, uh, you think that these guys need to be pestered with. Uh, so why don't I start out with, uh, uh, with David for his initial thoughts. Thank you, uh, Buzz. Uh, first, a minor correction. Uh, class is 78, not 75. Okay. I, I'm not that, not that old yet. Actually, I'm older. What am I saying? No, no, not that old yet. 78. <laughs> I'm hoping that when I come back next time, I'll be class of 80 or 82. Or <laughs> Uh, I am a recidivist uh, at the uh, Department of the Interior. Uh, I, I, my wife tells me it's, uh, women do this when, they're with, when they continue to have babies. They just forget how painful it was and somehow look back and say, let's do it again. Uh, although I must say, I didn't think an oil spill was in my job description. Uh, we have the National Parks, the Bureau of Land Management, the National Conservation Landscape System, terrific issues on water issues and uh, 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 Native Americans and uh, oil, oil spill was not in the job description. Um, and why not? It's interesting the, the, uh, the uh, very briefly, I look forward to our discussion. Uh, the fundamental problem with Deepwater Horizon was a safety problem. Um, and it's sort of a black swan problem uh, where um, the, they're, they're, are, are, we're wired to not think about the low probability, high consequence event that might occur. Let me give you a statistic. When we first came into office, we launched a review of all offshore drilling because the prior administration put on our lap the proposal to essentially open the entire Outer Continental Shelf to drilling. We said, let's, let's have a public process. We had open meetings across the country. We had 500,000 comments that came in, the most of any rulemaking I've been told in American history. Deep water safety dr uh, drilling issues were not raised by anybody. <laughs> Nobody thought there was a problem. Very interesting. No advocacy groups, no, no governmental organizations, no congressmen. It was now the spill response issues, sort of the traditional issues, but in terms of, of, of the safety issues and whether we had a good safety system or not was not on anyone's radar screen. That's very interesting, a, a regulatory failure that, that I look forward to, to talking about a little bit more. A couple of other very brief perspectives. Um, this was a very interesting uh, situation of government response to a national crisis. I was the first administration official down in the Gulf the morning after the accident. We had uh, the deputy secretaries uh, of the major agencies, three of us, uh, had with the rest of the government uh, every other day uh, meetings in the White House Situation Room as we figured out how to respond to this. Our department had over a thousand people in the Gulf in response. Uh, our regulatory agency had a command center uh, that, that, I, that I was at within 24 hours of the incident that showed how we were going to fix this problem very quickly. Don't worry. Um, but the, the, there are a lot of interesting things to talk about in terms of the nature of the government response. And, and finally, we had been um, on the road to a reform effort in this area. But ironically, we were focusing on what folks had identified as a reform concern in, in the area of our former Minerals Management Service, and that was revenue collection. 
We are the largest, after the IRS, we're the largest revenue collector in the United States. Uh, we, uh, in 2006, $25 billion from oil and gas revenues, primarily onshore and offshore. And there were concerns that, that, uh, that the, the uh, collectors were too cozy with industry, et cetera, so we, we pursued a very aggressive effort. We actually eliminated the royalty in kind program, uh, broad ethics in place, no one talked about safety. Ironically, we had actually started, we'd asked the National Academy of Sciences to come in and help us evaluate our inspection program for deep water safety a few months beforehand. Uh, but again, black swan, very interesting. Um, and, and finally, I will say um, that, that uh, and this goes to the response, we learned, I think, uh, an important lesson that the American people expect their government to be number one, as knowledgeable as any industry, that's for sure, on a, in a situation like this, and in charge. And the Oil Pollution Act that came out of the Exxon Valdez situation put the company in charge of the response. Uh, that was the innovation after the Exxon Valdez. That did not work here. It did not last long. Uh, but the, there's an important legal change that needs to be made here. And finally, uh, we in our administration, the Interior Department, have been focusing on renewable energy and climate change as our primary agenda. Many of you have been reading the last two or three weeks. We are citing this fall 3,000 megawatts of new renewable power in the Southwest in major utility scale uh, solar projects. That's the equivalent of two Hoover dams. That's the equivalent of 10 coal-fired power plants that our administration is putting in place. I'm very disappointed there's not been a pivot to the recognition of the risk and, and downside of, of oil and gas as we saw on CNN every night uh, to, to help us with a debate to turn the corner toward a, a, a more broad and uh, robust renewable energy future and a new energy economy. And that's, I'm just setting it up for Dan here. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thank you, David. David is a dear friend. We did not conspire on that pivot. Um, so you're sure you want me to talk about the oil spill and not about kayaking? I, we, well, we could put it up for a vote. How many right, people? Right. <laughs> uh, so first of all, thank you very much. Really pleased, very pleased to be here. And I do have to quickly say that, that as things energy go, I don't know a huge amount about oil spills. That's, I have a different sort of a background. But, um, but I do know a little bit about what it's going to take, I think, to build a, a cleaner energy future. And I just want to make a couple of quick points. And the number one is we need to be thinking of a triangle of technology, policy, and finance. If we're going to build a cleaner energy future, if we're going to actually make it happen, if we're indeed going to make the pivot that David is talking about, we've got to be working to advance technologies in a much more committed and well-financed way than we are today. We've got to be putting the right policies in place, and there's got to be vast amounts of capital measured in the many trillions of dollars that are going to have to be put to work if we're going to make the kind of pivot that we need to make to move us off of fossil fuels and onto these cleaner energy sources. Technology, policy, finance. Um, and I think whether it's at a university in training students, the next generation of leaders, we've got to think in that comprehensive way, or in the professional community, or among advocates, um, or in government, this has got to happen. I just came over here from Google a couple of miles down the road, and we had the Secretary of Energy, Steve Chu, there a couple of hours ago. And we dug right into all three points of that triangle in what the government is up to, how it can work with the private sector, how it can work with the academic world, and how we can really advance this. And I think the bad news is an oil spill, like we saw in the Gulf. The good news is we are perfectly capable of building a clean energy future. And we should be the leaders in this country in doing so, but we run a risk of that not happening if we're not careful going forward. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Meg. So in keeping with the chain reaction of connections between us, um, one little known fact is that Dan is the reason that I went to Stanford and not Harvard, because he took it upon himself to um, allow me to come back and visit Harvard when he was there at the Kennedy School just prior to uh, my saying yes to Stanford, so thank you, Dan. <laughs> Appreciate that. It was a cold, gray day there. It was, actually. It was the Boston Marathon, and there's still snow on the ground. I remember that. So I've taken uh, more of a systemic look at, at the BP oil spill 
sort of everything leading up to the spill. And while I wouldn't disagree that obviously we had a major safety failure, um, what I would say in, is that we've had really a systemic breakdown in, um, in our federal system, in our regulatory system, uh, with offshore oil drilling. And that breakdown falls into two fundamental categories. One is in really honestly and, and, and uh, properly assessing the potential social, economic, and environmental impacts with offshore oil and gas drilling. And the second is a shocking lack of transparency in the decision-making process. So as I had to prepare to give written testimony, oral and written testimony, before Senate Environmental, Environment and Public Works Committee and the BP Oil Commission, and tried to dig up all of the sort of evidence of how these decisions were made and who was involved and what was being considered, it was very difficult to actually get the full paper trail. So let me just summarize sort of the, the daisy chain of decision making and, and some of the, the highlights for um, where I see some, uh, some of this breakdown. First of all, the federal law that governs offshore oil and gas drilling is, uh, is an old law. It actually dates back to the 50s, but it was revised. It was amended in 1978, largely in response to the big um, uh, oil crisis that we had in the 70s. And when that happened, Congress took it upon itself to basically designate a lot of the Gulf of Mexico, well, the full Gulf of Mexico, is what I would call something close to a sacrifice zone. They actually exempted some of the decision making for the Gulf from many of the environmental protections um, that, that we had come to expect uh, for major federal actions, including just making decisions on leases and exploration plans. Um, the second thing is that the, the federal agency that's really in charge of, of overseeing this entire process, then it's now renamed, but it was called the Minerals Management Service, um, had a real, I, I would say, a shocking lack of capacity to really review these plans. And it really was an instance where industry um, uh, was really in the driver's seat. Um, so it's no surprise to me that they weren't able to identify these really important um, safety failures in, uh, in the, the exploration plan itself, and it's no surprise that they weren't equipped to um, uh, honestly evaluate the, the cleanup plan because they just didn't really have the capacity to do that. But even if they did have the capacity, I think they were really... Um, taking the lead from Congress with the, the federal statute that governs offshore oil and gas leasing. And um, they really took a pass on a lot of their obligations under the National Environmental Policy Act. And that's a federal statute that asks every single federal agency to evaluate the potential environmental impacts associated with their decision making. And then finally, within this context of, of the Minerals Management Service, um, they, they also failed to reach out to their sister agencies who had important expertise pertaining to offshore oil and gas exploration in the Gulf. And these would be NOAA, the National Oce Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration, the US EPA, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, who really knew what was going on with the ecology of the Gulf, what kind of species were at risk, and in particular for particular geographies where um, exploration was going to take place, um, whether or not there were some serious potential impacts associated with that drilling. The next stage is the state. Under the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act, the states have an opportunity to take a, a, a whack at federal actions in offshore oil and gas drilling, and the states of Louisiana and Mississippi really took a pass. Um, they did not have strong laws themselves, so they, um, unlike California, who has a really strong coastal act, we take every opportunity to examine federal actions and to advise the federal agencies where we think that they can do better and meet our standards under our own state law, and that simply wasn't happening with Louisiana and Mississippi. Next, the courts. The courts really have played a very minor role here, and it's in part because they have trouble figuring out how to insinuate themselves between a very um, permissive standard for discretion to federal agencies in their decision making 
And then the fact that so much of the National Environmental Policy Act was short-circuited um, through this whole decision-making process, they had very little opportunity to play a role. And I would agree that there, there was less oversight than we traditionally see by the watchdog NGOs uh, with uh, this particular situation, especially in the Gulf. So, um, you know, the, certainly the citizen suits weren't there in the numbers that we typically see them for terrestrial um, exploitation. Okay. Debbie. Thanks. Um, well, so here's the thing about playing cleanup. You all have raised great issues. But so let me do this. Let me um, uh, maybe get, throw out there some of the bigger questions because I, I, I don't disagree with anything that anyone has said here so far. And, and I do think that it, it um, you know, as we've dug into the uh, sort of the history, not just of this particular well, but the history of um, kind of oil leasing in the last decade or so in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, that um, we were unprepared, technologically unprepared to respond to a spill, scientifically unprepared to understand what the impacts of a spill might be, and I think we're still unprepared to, to, to even know what those impacts will be in the long term. Um, and, and so there were systemic failures. I, I think probably we'd all agree with that in, in terms of some of them have been um, inconsistent with what with the notion that Meg described of kind of a sacrifice zone down there and perhaps what Congress was doing. But what I hope we get to today a little bit is to talk about um, a bit about what the solutions might be to that. And I think we've struggled um, a lot with this. One, uh, just to you know, throw out a, a quote there out of one of the BP oil exploration plans out there, the company described it as unlikely that an accidental oil spill release would occur from the proposed exploration activities, right? So, um, so we were unprepared for what happened out there and why were we unprepared? One of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is it's, it, it's akin in some way to the ways we were unprepared for the financial collapse because we have an agency um, that maybe doesn't have the capacity to, to really even understand uh, the, the, the technological and scientific implications and what do we do about that? So reforms I think are important and good, but um, can we really expect our government agencies and, and, and under, uh, under the current Secretary of Interior, we're looking at reforms to the agency and how to, you know, maybe tease apart some of the regulatory functions from the revenue generating functions. Those are important reforms. But I think there is this bigger question of how um, government uh, really can step back in and, and play an effective oversight role uh, and, ha and how we do that. I did note, I think it was just today or yesterday in the paper, the um, Secretary of Interior, um, Ken Salazar, has begun to talk about a new institute um, where you'd bring together government, academe, and, and the private sector to, to really take a hard look at some of these issues to the extent that they were safety issues, but also sort of are we prepared for, the, uh, uh, for these kind of risks which we know are going to happen, right? I mean, we can say it's low, low probability, but if we keep drilling out there and we, we keep engaging in these activities, we're, it's going to happen again, and how can we be prepared for that? And then I would just close on, and I hope we get to this too, um, the larger question of, because it's fascinating to me that although this was in the news almost every day, uh, we're six months, it's just about, just almost exactly six months out from, from the beginning of the spill, and it's dropped out of the news almost in, entirely. Um, doesn't mean the impacts aren't happening, both ecologically and to the people who live down the region, the impacts to their lives. Um, but it's, it's, it is shocking to me that that uh, we, we haven't seen the pivot point, um, you know, and, and why is that? In, in part, is it because we have, it, it, the, we've, there's been some kind of collective decision that, that we're gonna live with those trade-offs. Why is it different than um, a, a nuclear disaster? Uh, because oil's vital, right? And are we gonna, um, you know, what can we do about that? So I hope we get to those issues of, of really transparency and having a democratic discussion about you know, whether this is the right thing to do 
or not. And I'm, so I'm saddened to see that it's fallen out, but maybe, maybe we can keep that conversation going here. So you've all raised really interesting issues. I want to start out uh, talking a little bit more about this concept of regulatory failure. And Meg, you suggested that this is more than simply a safety failure. This was a fundamental regulatory failure. And you talked about some of the problems that you've identified in your examination uh, of the oil spill and what led up to the uh, oil spill. I'm curious if uh, you were in David's uh, position, so you're Deputy Secretary of the Interior. What would be the two or three most important changes that you would make either within the agency or that you would recommend that Congress make in order to avoid this problem in the future? I only get two or three. Yeah. Okay, then well, I'm gonna give, I'm Debbie gonna give will Debbie take my balance, <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, with respect to Congress, I, I would definitely recommend uh, amendment of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act so that it makes clear that, uh, that the agencies who are responsible for implementing that act um, are also responsible for um, being caretakers of our um, of the ecological systems um, where this drilling is taking place. We have a new executive order here in the United States from President Obama in July that establishes a national ocean policy. It prioritizes for every single federal agency um, long-term sustainability of our ocean ecosystems, our marine and coastal ecosystems. And um, so he's established this as the new ocean policy. And OXLA, the federal law that allows us to um, go into these deep water areas and drill, um, is out of sync with that policy. It has some very soft language about safeguarding the environment, but it's clear that it is um, dominated with an interest in expediting offshore oil and gas drilling at the expense of the environment. Um, so that uh, somehow resolving that conflict um, in that law uh, that the agencies have to comply with, I think would be important. With MMS, I would by the way, I would, just for, for the sake of the audience, uh, there are a lot of acronyms that oh, we can sorry. slip into, yeah. so if you can I'm Trying to give not the names. acronymize yeah. my, yeah. So the federal law that allows offshore oil and gas drilling um, is called OXLA, but I won't use that term anymore. The, the Minerals Management Service, uh, which is a bureau within the Department of Interior, uh, has already uh, been re recommended for restructuring and Secretary Salazar has recommended that the revenue generation and collection be separated from the permitting um, and um, from enforcement, which I think is fabulous. That's absolutely in the right direction. There's one more change that I think is worthy of careful consideration, and that is uh, to add a very strong scientific component to that agency so that it does have the capacity to really understand the technological details of what these companies are proposing, but also the biological and social and economic um, consequences, positive and, and negative, of um, these activities. And I would recommend that that scientific capacity be separate, just as revenue collection is sep would be separate and enforcement would be separate, so that there's real integrity in um, the information that the agency is receiving from um, the scientific community and, um, and that we don't have to worry about the desire and zeal for, um, for uh, collecting, getting more gas and, and revenue to influence um, the scientific uh, input at all. Debbie, you, wanna, you, you have an opportunity to list your two top. Sure. Let me... Um, I guess one would be that I'd like to see the market uh, work here a little more effectively. So I think as David, David alluded to, um, there was a statute passed in the wake of the Exxon Valdez spill. Part of what that did was put a cap on liability um, for companies that were drilling out there. And that seems counterintuitive to me because then it means that the, the drillers are not uh, uh, entirely internalizing the risks here. Um, we, we have BP saying we're going to pay for damages and compensation beyond that, but just so, so that's a separate issue of this particular oil spill, but it seems to me going forward, and I think probably there's broad consensus that that cap needs to be raised at some point, but, but in addition, thinking about how 
market mechanisms could work um, to align uh, the interests of the companies that are uh, functioning out there with um, adequate protection of the environment. So we, we have this, say, in the hazardous waste field where um, companies that are handling hazardous waste have to put up performance bonds of, of, of various kinds to, um, to, to really ensure that there is protection to pay for damages down the line. That tr often triggers kind of an insurance function out there. Now, when you're talking about companies of the size of Exxon and BP, I'm not sure how that all would work, but I think that's a thing for, that, that it would be useful for Congress to take a careful look at, for Interior to take a careful look at how can we um, try to create those market incentives uh, uh, that, that sort of counteract the pressure to, to go forward in an expedited manner. And I don't think all the facts are sorted out here, but, um, and, and there are, there's lots of litigation going on around this, but uh, I think we will see that there, there was an enormous amount of pressure, whether there was human error um, or not, that'll be sorted out, but there is a lot of pressure. And so sort of uh, uh, requiring companies to actually um, ensure those risks down the line, I think would be one thing to look at. I guess the other, and, um, and Meg and I have done a lot of thinking about this, is, uh, is some kind of either regulatory or statutory reform that would uh, ensure that these activities are really looked at closely at the point um, where we're really giving away the development rights. So what the stage we were at with um, the Deep Horizon uh, Deepwater Horizon well was at the exploration stage, right? So, so there were already uh, development rights and leases in the hands of the companies that were working out there. And again, enormous amount of pressure. I mean, e even assuming the best of faith among um, uh, MMS employees who were trying to overview, oversee these plans, uh, a lot of pressure to move forward and, and allow uh, development to happen. In my view, one of the systemic failures is before we hand out those development rights, we ought to be taking a closer look at what's, where these facilities w are located and what might be the particular risks associated with them. Um, I think we do that a little better on the land side. I'm not sure why we don't do it on the ocean side, except it seems like an undifferentiated you know, seascape out there, and we know that's not true. Um, one of the things that uh, the current administration is very interested in is this whole idea of marine spatial planning, um, and, uh, and that is an idea to look at what resources are where and what are good places to develop, to develop maybe not so good places to develop. So I would hope that we'd, look at, we'd think about those concepts and try to bring them into the leasing decisions that we make going forward. So David, uh, you've now heard from two of your counselors as to what it is that uh, the Department of the Interior should do or should recommend to, well, uh, to Congress. I know that the Department of the Interior has uh, been improving the uh, regulations uh, for uh, deep water exploration uh, uh, work. I'm both curious as to if you could sort of quickly highlight what it is that the Department of the Interior has done, and to the degree that you haven't followed Meg's and, and Debbie's advice yet, is this good advice? Sure, they're hired. You, uh, <laughs> GS 13 will we'll slot you right in, and uh, we'd love to have you. Negotiate. Um, 14. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, there's a lot to talk about here. I, I'll just focus on a few things. Um, we, we have, this has been an, this, you know, out of crisis comes opportunity here to, to remake the way we approach uh, our regulation of offshore oil and gas and, and broader, broader uh, opportunities as well, including ocean planning that we already had underway, as, as mentioned, uh, uh, the Obama administration has been pushing very hard on that. I, I would, uh, we have, uh, I would prioritize our, uh, what I think uh, the important issues differently than than um, Meg and Debbie a little bit. Um, I don't think it's primarily a statutory problem. Uh, I think it is, is primarily a, a regulatory mechanism problem. And what we have done is we have already separated out, as of, of uh, October 1, the revenue uh, section of the of this former Minerals Management Service, now the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement. 
we obviously didn't spend any money on branding. Uh, <laughs> Bomer, <laughs> Bomer is what we call it. Not, not to be uh, confused with bummer. Right, right. <laughs> Um, so that's already separated. We, we have a, a huge contract with McKinsey. Uh, they are working with us to uh, separate out the leasing function of the uh, uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management from the safety and enforcement function. Those need to be separated. Uh, there's no question that putting them together and potentially having the, the economic interests drive and, and overcome the safety questions and environmental questions is a problem. I think statutorily there are some things that can be done to improve the statute, but I think it's not the primary problem. And ironically, actually, uh, the statute was used by the House Democratic leadership last year to use used as a model to help uh, our onshore approach uh, because it requires five years of a five-year planning process before areas are opened up, big time environmental analysis, and then a further big time environmental analysis before lease sales occur. Uh, it does have some, some clear some problems. The, the liability constraint is a problem. There is a requirement that exploration plans be approved within 30 days, which means you're not going to get the type of NEPA analysis later in the process that we think is needed, and the Obama administration has asked for those uh, changes. Um, but, but primarily, uh, uh, I don't think this, the statute is that big a problem. It's primarily, I think, the regulatory structure that needs to be changed, and, and we are changing it. And I think that there is a tendency to really um, overemphasize, um, uh, let me say, underemphasize the safety issues and the technology issues. The big problem here is that the government was left behind as industry went forward with its frontier drilling at greater and greater depths. Uh, and as these folks mentioned along the way, uh, you can't have that. We have to structurally have a situation where the government knows as much as industry. Uh, we had a little laboratory this summer down in Houston. Uh, as Ken Salazar and yours truly and Stephen Chu and Tom Hunter of Sandia National Lab and others work side by side with the best of industry. Uh, and, and we now know what we have to do. And yes, it was leaked yesterday that Ken and I had a meeting with the, the, the top CEOs of the oil and gas industry. We want to create an, an, uh, an Ocean Energy Safety Institute that should, look, that, should, that should provide an opportunity to have the best R&D for drilling safety, number one. Let's not overlook that. that and, and Stephen Chu, who has become a very good friend from uh, daily uh, interactions here through the summer, is appalled that this industry is a little insular. There are no pressure gauges on, on uh, BOPs, uh, blowout preventers. There, there are no, no, way, no uh, 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 gauges to figure out if the rams have closed and therefore you, you have the well sealed or not. This has been an insular industry. Electronics are not found there. That if there's a kick, how do you find out if there's, a, there's gas coming up? Uh, uh, you look at the mud and see if there are bubbles in it. I mean, this is Texas in the 40s, but we're in 5,000 feet of water. Uh, that's not right. We need to, to broaden it and to have R&D. We also found that, and this was mentioned, I don't know if it was by uh, Debbie uh, uh, or, or, uh, or Meg, uh, blowout containment was simply not on anyone's radar screen. Uh, our, everyone thought what we had to worry about was spill response, the sort of traditional skimming of oil and that sort of thing. There was no uh, capability uh, to go down, and, and we saw it in excruciating detail this summer every day as we tried the, the, the junk kill, the top kill, the static kill, uh, and there were no kills. Uh, uh, finally, we, the static kill actually did work, uh, but the capping stack, and I, 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 I should have an honorary degree from uh, Texas A&M by now, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but, but in any event, we need R&D on that area, too. We need the government and the government national labs and others to be as good as industry and pushing, and likewise on spill response, as Bill Riley has said, the uh, co-commissioner uh, for the Presidential Commission. This is pitiful. We go down to the, the Gulf and go out and look at these, these, you know, Rube Goldberg things that, you know, trying to skim oil and vacuums and, oh my lord, uh, we can surely do better than that. Uh, so we've got a, we got a rich tableau of, of reforms and uh, we're pushing hard and, uh, and we're going we're gonna to make a difference.
Okay, so I want to actually pivot right now to the topic of how can we pivot from our reliance upon uh, uh, traditional fossil fuels over to renewable fuels? Hey, something. Buzz, before, before yeah, you do go that, ahead, I, Dan. I, I, I'm sitting here and I'm pretty amazed by what David is saying because the you know we went through this in 1979 with the Three Mile Island accident, um, and we appointed a presidential commission. It was headed by the uh, president then of Dartmouth, uh, John Kennedy, Albert Einstein's last graduate student. And out of this came unbelievable amount of learning. Right. And out of this came major, major reform. Um, and we fundamentally changed the way we were both doing the critical R&D on safety systems, on how we were regulating both existing and potentially new power plants, a whole host of things. And you know, you can debate the merits of nuclear power, but we have a much, much safer industry. And then along came 1986 and Chernobyl, and that really put an exclamation point on the, on the change that we need to make. So we have an industry, in contrast, where um, an accident did happen. It happened a long time ago, and we made some fundamental changes. So this isn't, this isn't rocket science, as people say. It just, it's always unfortunate that what it takes is a big accident to wake people up to the need for, for real vigilance and reform, both in terms of regulation, technology development, and a whole host of other things. Yeah. So let me play off of, of that particular point. Again, one of the things that both you and David mentioned earlier was the importance of beginning to pivot from our reliance on fossil fuels over to greater reliance on renewable energy, something that the Obama administration has been pushing. Uh, and there are a lot of political pundits out there that say this was a wasted opportunity. You had a major energy bill before Congress, you were trying to deal with climate change, and here was an opportunity, as Dan just pointed out, to take a major wake-up call and use it to actually get uh, a strong national policy favoring renewable energy. So my first question is actually for you, David. What what went wrong? Why didn't you? Well, uh, why weren't you able to use this particular opportunity to get a really strong energy bill through Congress? Have you been observing Congress, <laughs> <laughs> Buzz? I mean, the I mean, the, you ask a harder question. Here's the easier question: Why didn't Congress take up the very basic, obvious? Flaws directly associated with this law, like the liability cap, like the 30-day limitation on, on environmental reviews for uh, exploration plans. We had a suite of, like, like uh, the reorganization, codifying the reorganization that we're doing administratively. Uh, it passed the House, it's languished in the Senate. Uh, perhaps it'll be taken up in lame duck, but that's the easy stuff. Uh, the, and then uh, it is beyond me why we can't uh, move on to climate change. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the cap and trade has become uh, uh, the, uh, the death knell, ironically, when cap and trade was, was a concept that, uh, um, as you well know, and as, as you advocated as well, was, was, was viewed by conservatives as the, the right way to regulate, to provide an opportunity to, to, to cap overall carbon emissions, but let the market figure out the best and lowest cost way to do that. And ironically, it's been turned into a, a, a dead weight concept. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I am um, happily in the administrative branch of government. Uh, and uh, we oh, have plenty, plenty to do without the Congress. And I'm not sure the, the new Congress is going to be any kinder here. So we will, we will continue to build renewable energy projects. We will continue to work on climate change impacts on our resources, our water supplies, our wildlife, et cetera. And, and we, we must all continue to uh, educate the American people about uh, what is happening to our planet. So then a question for, for you, Dan, which is, you know, given that the oil spill didn't lead to a significant new energy bill in Congress, you know, what is going to lead, if anything, uh, to a major change in our energy policy in the United States? You know, what can serve as that wake-up call if it wasn't uh, the uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill? Or should we just give up on trying to change policy in the U.S. So, and go privately? So, three quick things. One, David alluded to the so-called lame duck session in between the election and the, the new Congress coming in. I think there's a modest 
modest possibility that we could see some energy legislation um, move there. It won't be a climate cap and trade sort of bill, but there's still some life in potentially setting a national renewable energy standard, putting some financing mechanisms in place that we desperately need to spur the development of renewable energy. There's, there's some things that could come together, plus some of these reforms potentially around oil spills. I don't put a high probability on that, but we may see some resolve as we saw in 1980 um, after a momentous election for something like this. So that's, that's number one. Number two, what else is happening that will spur this? Well, I think to the extent it's bad news in Washington and the Congress, we have better news in the states. We now have 30 states that have set uh, renewable energy standards. We have a lot of activity that the states are really pushing hard because they see it as what it is, um, a real economic opportunity. Um, I talked before about what is going to be required to fundamentally rebuild our energy system in this country and around the world is literally trillions of dollars. And individual states want to own those markets. Um, and that takes me to the third point, which is there's another country on this planet that really wants to own this market and is beating our pants off at this point, and that's China. Um, the Chinese have made so much progress in this clean energy arena. Um, that's where much of the new technology is being built right now in clean energy, uh, increasingly wind turbines and a huge percentage of solar panel manufacturing now. And the Chinese are, have said, we want to now move on and not just be the manufacturers, we also want to be the inventors of this technology. And by the way, we have plenty of spare cash. We'd also like to start investing in projects in clean energy in the United States and around the world. If we're not careful, um, we could seed this very, very exciting market in clean energy technology, um, a market that we invented over the last 30 years. And, and sitting here in this state, in this valley, we've had a lot, to, a lot to do with. The last quick thing is bringing it close to home. Um, even California, where so much of this has gotten started, where so much of this is, uh, where the promise is so great, we're considering a, a, a ballot initiative, Proposition 23, which would, which would undo the state's commitment to climate change, the state's climate law, AB 32. And if, if that were to pass, um, it would be a very poor signal about, the, again, the commitment of, of this state, and I think more, indeed, the US generally, to taking advantage of what this whole clean energy economy means. The good news, I think, is that uh, AB 23's fortunes, I'm sorry, Proposition 23's fortunes are declining, and we may actually be able to defeat it, but that's not a, that's not a done deal at this point. So bottom line, I, I do worry, as David does, that not a lot is happening in Congress. But the good news is I think there are lots of other ways we can get this done. So David, I might have been a little bit unfair earlier asking you know, what you might have done differently in order to try to get Congress to actually enact uh, a, um, uh, an adequate energy bill uh, this year. As you point out, uh, you're in an administrative position, so what is it that the Department of the Interior is working on in order to try to build up the renewable portfolio that the United States can use? Well, we, we have, um, and this is, I'm glad you asked the question because it's, it's a positive story. We can, we can easily get discouraged in this area, but there, the, uh, there, there are great, uh, great things happening. Um, we, we are the land managers of 25% of the United States and the Outer Continental Shelf the opportunities are enormous in terms of renewable energy. And I think what, what, what we need to do to get to the clean energy economy is to actually see that it can work on a large scale, a utility scale. Um, and, and by using the, the uh, off-derided stimulus bill uh, as incentives, uh, we, are, we are this fall uh, um, permitting 3,000 megawatts of solar power in the Southwest, as I mentioned, plus we, working with the Western governors, we've identified 24 renewable energy zones throughout the West uh, for potential solar development. We want to be smart from the start, pick the right places to do this, and evaluate them very carefully environmentally, uh, but provide, but, but, uh, but, but do it in a, in a way that will attract uh, a, a business interest and permit them. We have an internal goal of 9,000 megawatts of new renewable energy. Uh, out of the Interior Department uh, by the end of next year. Uh, we have, we, uh, apologies to those who you, of you who vacation in Cape Cod. 
but we permitted the Cape Wind Project, will be the, which will be the largest offshore wind project in the world. Uh, and, uh, and we have the, the Atlantic coast is less than 100 feet uh, in depth, out 20 miles by and large. And it has the best wind in the world. It could generate uh, 4,000 gigawatts of wind. That is four times the amount that is carried on our grid system in the United States. Now, we don't want wind turbines up and down the coast, uh, but we're going to do the same thing on offshore wind. We're gonna find, working with the states, working with our sister agencies, the look, find the right places for development, uh, gather the information, put prospectuses out there for industry, provide the opportunity for that investment. It's huge. Um, uh, so uh, there is, uh, our, our department is, is actually doing this thing, showing the way. We're also working on transmission. Uh, there's a huge amount of stranded uh, uh, power, uh, and we are, we are fast-tracking some transmission projects. This is tough stuff uh, because there are trade-offs in all of this, but we have to remember there are trade-offs with traditional oil and gas. And a final comment in that respect. I think what will help in terms of ultimately the new energy economy are, are, the, are, are the facts on the one hand that changing our energy economy will create an enormous new uh, infrastructure and job creating machine. Uh, we had technology uh, in the 90s. We need a new uh, job driver and a clean energy economy is big time a job driver. And we are reminded periodically that our reliance on, on oil and gas, oil in particular, that we don't have here in the United States is not good for economic security, it's not good for national security. And folks are ready to embrace a clean energy economy if it can become competitive. The way to do it is to show the way and make it happen, and that's what the Obama administration is trying to do. So in a moment, I'm gonna open it all to, well, uh, to you for, uh, for questions, but there's, there's one other question that I wanna ask, uh, because I also wanna get into questions of just protection of the Gulf of Mexico and protection of our oceans. So in response to, well, the Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster, uh, the Department of the Interior imposed a six-month moratorium on uh, uh, deep uh, ocean uh, exploration while they were developing new regulations, figuring out how to avoid this problem uh, in the future. Uh, but each year, uh, we dump about one million tons of nitrate into the uh, Gulf of Mexico th through the Mississippi River. So you have all those farms up and down the Mississippi River. There's fertilizer and also nutrient-rich sediment, which is being discharged in the river. That then gets discharged out into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, as a result of that, as probably a number of you know, there's a dead zone that forms in the Gulf of Mexico every year. Uh, and that dead zone at its largest was about 9,000 square miles. Uh, so it's beginning to sound an awful lot like uh, a oil spill uh, in its size and its potential consequences. Uh, and to link this back up to uh, energy, a recent study suggests that the U.S.'s current uh, goal of increasing the amount of biofuels produced in the United States to 36 billion gallons by 2022 uh, will severely increase the problem of the, uh, of the dead zone. So the question I'm curious about is if as a result of the BP oil spill, we imposed a moratorium on exploration uh, in deep waters, should we impose a moratorium on all of the farms up and down the uh, Mississippi Valley, or at least impose a moratorium uh, on uh, corn-based ethanol uh, until we figure out how to avoid the, uh, the dead zone? So Meg, you're our oceans expert. Mm. Thanks, Buzz. Uh, <laughs> I have two things to say about that, the farm bill and the ag waiver. So um, as you and I both know, because I know you as a member of the board of the American Farmland Trust uh, have been working to really reform the farm bill so that we stop linking subsidies to farmers um, that encourage really bad behavior like excessive application of fertilizers that are chock full of nitrogen. Um, and uh, so there are some very fundamental problems with that governance system that are encouraging bad behavior. And then if, um, even if that were working well, 
we have another federal statute called the Clean Water Act that was supposed to give us uh, swimmable, uh, fishable, clean water by 1985 um, that we are far from um, accomplishing um, that, those goals. And agriculture has the largest free pass under the Clean Water Act, and it's called the Ag Waiver. It waives them from having to comply with the uh, regulations and standards that everybody else has to comply with. Um, so this is a political play that happens in Washington, D.C. Every time uh, the Farm Bill is revisited, it plays out locally and regionally with um, big ag and small ag alike um, uh, successfully campaigning with uh, the local politicians. And um, that needs to be fixed because the fact is, is that we know how to do it right. We know that we don't need to be applying excessive quantities of fertilizers. We know that we can irrigate differently so that we don't have this kind of runoff off our farms. It's polluting our river systems and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico and Chesapeake Bay and Elkhorn Slough. Uh, and, and so the technology is there and the knowledge is there. Uh, it, it's simply inconvenient to um, adopt that technology right now with our system. Dan, you look like you want to address this question too. So not only do we know how to do it right in terms of farming, but we also know how to make uh, biofuels in, in a whole host of other ways that take us well beyond isolating the little bit of starch in a kernel of corn in a large stock of a corn plant. It's called cellulosic ethanol. It's moving from there to even being able to make it out of algae. Essentially. Increasingly, the bio world is able to produce ethanol from feedstocks that um, have, are much less destructive environmentally than, than growing corn with fertilizer intensive farming practices. So um, lots of private and government investment in this world of so-called cellulosic ethanol and increasing amount of investment in making it from algae. Uh, so, uh, the biofuels, mixing our gasoline with biofuels doesn't have to be something that in fact produces this dead zone or helps produce this dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. It can in fact be a great way to reduce our dependence on oil, whether we get it out of the Gulf or we get it um, from other countries. I'd also have to say, it's, it's interesting, the day that you lifted the moratorium and the ethanol limits were raised in gasoline was also the day that Google and two other companies um, announced that we were investing in a project to build a transmission line from New Jersey to Virginia off the Atlantic coast that would allow many, many thousands of megawatts of offshore wind power to be built. This would be a high voltage DC line underwater that would essentially allow you to hook up thousands and thousands of megawatts of wind instead of having to struggle to build this transmission line onshore, which is going to be very, very hard to do. We are, in fact, talking right now to our friends at the Department of the Interior, which... Who would that be? Who would that be? <laughs> <laughs> David was gracious enough to meet with us, um, as is the new head of the Minerals Management Service, now renamed. Um, we're going to be going through a very detailed process to get permits from there and from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and we hope to be under construction two plus years from now um, building this, this transmission line. That starts with 6,000 megawatts of wind, but it, is, it could be expanded like the interstate highway system to be capturing tens and tens of thousands of megawatts of wind just offshore where huge populations of this country live and where, frankly, we don't have that many other good renewable energy resources to, to take advantage of. So again, there's a good news story in all of this when it comes to what we can do for, uh, to advance okay. renewables. Okay, so David, really fast, because I want to make sure people have an opportunity to ask questions. Yeah, okay, just, just very quickly. This is a very important point, uh, the, the dead zone in the Gulf. It, it's a reminder that the Gulf is, is sick. Uh, it, it, the, the wetlands lost in the Gulf over the last number of decades has been enormous. Uh, and there is an opportunity out of this oil spill to potentially address some of the systemic losses in the Gulf. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to watch uh, 
whether we're successful in doing that or not. Lisa Jackson was just named by the president to head up uh, the, the restoration effort. We will have natural resource damages coming out of the uh, Gulf oil spill. Uh, the problem is those, the, the channelization of the Mississippi River has, has le lessened the sediment uh, de uh, deposition. And when you, when you fly over those, those marshes and you can see them disappearing before your eyes practically, it is stunning and tragic. And, uh, uh, and that's one piece of it, but, but, but stay tuned. Let's see how much money is spent and, and how much political will there is to do a major restoration effort in the Gulf. It's a historic opportunity, and I hope it's not missed. Okay, so we have two mics, uh, and uh, uh, if you could just form a line before each mic, what I'm gonna do is sort of switch back and forth, and because I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of questions, if you could keep the questions relatively short, and I'm gonna ask the panelists if you can keep your answers relatively short, so I'll start on this side. Okay. Uh, what I'm hearing really from many of you is something that I heard back in the law school classes 30 years ago, which was really, you know, capturing the externalities of what policy decisions are and what things really cost. And I think in our society that's what we're doing. We're really coming to grips with what are things really costing us because the costs are mounting up, whether they're chronic or they're, you know, uh, an acute situation. And it seems to me that the challenge we have is really how do we as a society have a discussion about what things really cost because people say oh it's a jobs killer or oh you know we can't do this while it's hurting the economy you know da 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 and in essence nobody's standing up that I'm hearing and saying well look at you know we've really lived beyond our means we have borrowed from our children we have stolen from you know taken from the environment things that are unsustainable but we're not having a discussion about that and I'm wondering what you think you could do or you think Stanford could do to engage that discussion if you think that that's appropriate because unless we get through that I think we're just chipping at the margin on trying to deal with these issues you know making a little tweak here a little tweak there if people don't buy into the premise of where we are and what the reality is I don't think we can get there okay. who wants to take that Meg you're looking in my direction I can start anyways so Baby steps would be just simply taking seriously environmental impact review because it really was meant to do a lot of what you're talking about, to lay bare what the true costs are, the environmental costs, the social costs, the, the economics of a decision, um, and to explore alternatives and allow decision makers to honestly balance uh, trade-offs. And the way we've implemented uh, that, that federal statute and the state equivalents has really varies throughout the nation. And MMS, the Minerals Management Service, I would say is one of the sort of um, least capable of effectively implementing that statute. They've shown themselves to be. And David, you mentioned big environmental review. Well, the only thing big about the environmental review, as far as I can see, having looked at the environmental assessment and the environmental impact statement for the five-year lease sale and then for the multi-lease sale, um, is that it covers a huge swath of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the content of those reviews um, shows a, a shocking lack of contemplation of just these issues. And, and it includes boilerplate language and pablum about um, potential impacts, downplays the risks. Um, so we're, we're paying lip service to these uh, where we could be honestly evaluating them. Um, the second thing I would say is that we, we actually are coming up with new ways of looking at um, options. And uh, we, we've got a project here at Stanford under the Woods Institute, the Natural Capital Project. Uh, I'm more familiar with the marine side of it uh, that actually looks at the options from a systemic standpoint and looks at in ecosystem services that are delivered by um, our, our environment and, um, and attempts to um, sort of um, uh, give voice to those in a way that can and, and give value to them in a way that might be meaningful in a business setting and an agency decision making setting. So we're trying to come up with new technologies really for trying uh, to enlighten our decision making. Uh, it's very, very tough and as long as we have 
um, uh, so much of the decision making happening at a political level that allows for bypassing of this transparency and, and laying out options, I think we'll, we'll still be in trouble. Yeah. David, really quickly. Very quickly. I think it's a profoundly important question. I think we need new tools to have these discussions that, that, that take into account the realities of the pressures. The, the fact that the oil and gas industry cried foul that w we were stopping deep water drilling while we were looking at fundamental safety issues shows how hard it is. And all due respect to Meg, I don't think the National Environmental Policy Act is going to be the, the vehicle to do it. Uh, uh, throughout the government, that's become, you know, a, a, a it's, it's, not, it's not a serious place for the discussion by big players on the big issues that we need to have. I do think that, that, um, uh, that the, some of the things Meg is talking about, that Buzz has helped really champion here at Stanford in terms of reminding people of what is at stake, what those externalities are, what our natural environment does for us in terms of clean water, in terms of, of the carbon cycle, et cetera. We need to push, push forward this thinking and broaden the horizon of folks and, have, and, and hope for a more serious opportunity for political dialogue. So, so let me just, I'll, I'll say this fast, because the, to me, the, potentially the most profound way to internalize these externalities is in fact, in some, some way, put a price on carbon emissions. That would have the impact that um, almost nothing else would other countries have already stepped up to it. We've seen fundamental changes. And if you go back to my triangle of technology, policy, and finance, that, will con that would radically I increase interest in technology investment, and it would radically increase the availability of capital to, to make these changes. So that's, that, to me, is one of the big opportunities here that, that we really need to take advantage of. So let me just say, by the way, just sort of looking at the number of people uh, that are standing up, no one new should get up. Uh, I think this is going to be the limit of how many questions could, we're going to be able to. Stand what? Up, so uh, okay, okay. Well, you, you, you get to count. You, right. Absolutely. Okay, David. Uh, and the other thing is, again, what I'm going to ask is that yeah. you know, just one or two of the panelists respond yeah. to each question from this God. point. Uh, I'm troubled with wind power in that it's my understanding that, that wind doesn't blow all the time, and therefore there has to be a back up megawatt by megawatt of hydrocarbon generation policy. So for every 100 megawatts of wind you have, you have to have 100 megawatts of hydrocarbon backup. And if that's so, doesn't that reduce the value of wind power? Dan, I think that's your question. It doesn't always blow. So you, number one, you put it in places where it blows more than it does in other places. That's called capacity factor, and you want to find high capacity factors. One of the very interesting aspects of this big transmission line we want to build is that if you have a spread between New York and Virginia, frequently at some point along the way, the wind is going to be blowing and you're going to be sending electricity through that. But you are right. You do need some backup capacity, and that typically is in the form of, of natural gas generation. Um, you do need base load. There's other kinds of renewable base load power. But it's not a problem that we need to worry about very, very much for a long, long time. We can, we can add a lot of wind capacity um, and do a lot of good with it. And if we put it in smart places and do smart things with terms of transmission, it's, it's a much lower issue than and a lot of other things we're worrying about here today. Okay. So a question over here. Yes, I was, in August I was on um, a, a call that uh, EPA's National Environmental Justice uh, Advisory Council did on the BP oil spill and the environmental justice implications. And not surprisingly, they talked a lot about the lack of vigilance on the part of government and the overconfidence on the part of the industry. But it became very apparent very quickly that caller after caller or stakeholder after stakeholder had a complete lack of confidence in both government and in industry to address these issues going into the future. They said there's going to be another lack of vigilance on the public health impacts, on the environmental impacts over the long term. They talked about a short attention span of agencies. They talked about lack of capacity of state environmental agencies, particularly in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. So I guess my question for uh, the panel is how do you restore or build the competent confidence of these key stakeholders in this process. And many of them also talked about the fact that as key interlocutors between government and communities, they had no resources themselves. 
um, and it's unclear from the, you know, the BP oil spill fund whether they are actually going to be able to get some, some of those resources in order to function that capacity. Um, I, it's, a, it's a very important question. Um, the, uh, the reality is that the, the budgets for EPA and the Department of the Interior were the two hardest hit over the last eight years. Uh, and um, we have to invest uh, in government competence in these areas and value government competence in these areas. And uh, maybe it's a silver lining of something like this. It's a reminder that folks do look to their government to deliver these kinds of services. We do, we do live in a world where there's a lot of, um, th there's a, not a lot of confidence in institutions of all types. So uh, the challenge is before us, uh, but it's a very good point. Debbie. J just really quickly, I, I think one of the notions that's bubbled up there, and we, we do this in some other areas around national marine sanctuaries, sometimes around Superfund hazardous waste sites, is to, is to really try to empower advisory groups or citizen councils to play a watchdog role, to be a, a bit of, of an interface between the agencies and the larger community out there. And, and I think it's an interesting idea, you know, how they get funded and how they sustain themselves over time are, I think, difficult institutional questions and resource questions. But I do think that, that there, is, there are some models out there that we ought to be thinking about in, in, in terms of, of looking in this area as well. Okay. Next question. Chip Pitts from the law school. Um, I, I suppose it's not surprising, given that you're all lawyers, that there's been a, a large focus on the law and the government role. But I'm asking whether we're asking, we're letting BP off a little lightly here. Um, you know, BP is a company that had a track record, despite having world-class policies and procedures for this precise sort of thing and responsible action. You know, it's like Enron's code of conduct and policy. It's available on eBay, quote, never been opened, you know, brand new. Um, so in this case, BP had the Prudhoe Bay, Alaska spill, then it had the Texas refinery disaster. My question is whether this is really um, an area where the limits of the law come into play and we need to think about culture and values because we do know that there were, you know, Meg talked about shocking, and they really were shocking. It wasn't just boilerplate, but they referred to walruses and sea lions that don't exist in the Gulf in their disaster recovery manual. Um, so my question is, A, you know, is there, is there beneath the law things that the companies must do here? And then I'd also like to ask you whether, uh, Debbie, your idea of the scientific, you know, or maybe it was Meg, maybe both of you, the scientific evaluation, I think that's a great idea. But do we do that in the context of the precautionary principle, which is, you know, sort of the, the EU approach? Okay, so who wants to take the first question? David. Uh, I think there is a, a serious question about the safety culture of uh, BP and some other uh, companies, and uh, it, it raises profound questions about how best for government agencies to regulate that and to ensure that. Um, and, uh, uh, and our traditional approach of command and control prescriptive requirements does not get at that. Um, we just have uh, released a final rule requiring management systems be in place uh, for companies. This is uh, something we can learn more from. The UK and uh, Norway do this better than we do. We need to get to that point. Um, so uh, in terms of the science, I agree, and I didn't get a chance to comment on that earlier. Science has got to be a driver in our decision making. Um, the, we are blessed with 10,000 scientists at the Department of the Interior in the combination of the United States Geological Survey, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service. Our, our chief scientist is an oceanographer, Dr. Marcia McNutt, who used to teach here, I think, or anyway, be associated with She was a professor at Stanford. And, and uh, we, we, are, we just uh, uh, issued the first scientific integrity policy in the Obama administration. It's got to be part and parcel of what we do. Um, and, uh, and I, think, I think valuing science and making sure that science is always up front is, is critical here. So Debbie or Meg, did you want to comment on the precautionary principle? And you might even want to just quickly define what it is. <laughs> so the precautionary principle, and, and, and right, as, as you mentioned, in, in Euro some European countries, they take it more seriously than we do here. I think we sometimes give lip service to it here, which is the, the, the principle that um, 
you know, we ought, to, we ought to take precaution in terms of when we don't know when there's uncertainty out there about the impacts and, and the risks out there that we er ought to err on the side of um, being conservative around these issues. I mean, it's, it's got an interesting history here in the United States in, in terms of how we feel about it collectively as a, as a, um, as a, as a nation. Um, certainly, there's been attempts to write that principle into law in some places. There's been the attempts to write in kind of best available science or best available technology you know, into the law, but I think it goes back to your point of we can write all of that stuff into the law, but, but it's how it gets implemented out there, the culture, the corporate culture, the culture of the agencies there. Thanks. Next question. Uh, my name is James Hoffman. I'm a graduate of the uh, Stanford Law School class of 1960. Uh, 65 <laughs> years ago, uh, I had a scoutmaster who uh, emphasized that uh, you don't see well if you only climb to the top of a low hill, but if you climb a little higher and get up near one of the peaks or on the peak, you can uh, get a better perspective of what the land is really like. And uh, I want to refer to you ladies and gentlemen as having the access to that higher peak so that you can get the perspective that many of us need but don't have access to. And uh, my question is this. Uh, I, my reading tells me that we have a very economical source of immediate energy that would alleviate the need for uh, a crunching program on biofuels and, uh, and other forms of alternative energy and we could go about that system of of developing the alternatives uh, much more methodically and thoughtfully and, and with more research. Uh, if we were to use natural gas, which is in large supply, uh, low price, and abundant, available for the next 100 to 150 years uh, within our own domestic economy. And uh, I would, would want to ask, is government uh, uh, academia and uh, private industry collaborating well enough to evaluate the alternatives of natural gas so that we can uh, avoid many of the catastrophic costs that are associated with, with uh, some of the alternatives. Uh, one of the areas of research I'd like you to comment on is hydrogen research because the production of hydrogen as an energy source I'm told is a very good one. So I'm told, by the way, that we have four minutes left, and I want to make sure the people who are standing up there have an opportunity to ask their questions. So, uh, very short. Let me just take a quick uh, thing on natural gas, because that's, that's, it, it's, natural gas is a hugely important bridge fuel at the least. The game changer has been the discovery of gas and shales around the country. Uh, but there are some significant issues about potential contamination associated with fracking of these gas structures. Uh, the administration is actually, we've launched a study of that issue. Uh, our department, which has jurisdiction over fracking on the public lands, is going to be starting a process to evaluate and identify best practices. Uh, it's like everything else. Uh, there, there are, there are trade-offs. It, it, it does look like a very important potential domestic policy, uh, domestic uh, supply, but there are some serious issues, as any of you who live in Pennsylvania or New York uh, have been uh, reading about. If we get it right, we can, it can be a, a, a big help, I think. And of course, we have a huge amount of stranded gas in Alaska that we would like to get down a, in a new pipeline, uh, although at uh, $4 uh, uh, cubic uh, a foot of gas, uh, uh, no one's going to invest in that. I just have to, I thought where you were headed was not to natural gas, but to the most obvious low cost source, which is energy efficiency. That is the cheapest thing we've got, you know. Replacing the 25-year-old refrigerator in your kitchen is a tenth the cost of putting solar panels on the roof um, to make the same amount of electricity. And we need to be doing all of these things. We need to be pushing renewables. We need to be taking advantage of this bridge fuel and natural gas. But the cheapest, simplest, near-term, lowest cost is, is energy efficiency. And California actually has a good record, and the Obama administration has a good record in promoting it. Okay. Next question. 
Uh, going back real quick to the BP oil spill, this question is directed to w Deputy Secretary Hayes. Uh, one issue that we saw was that the regional offices of MMS were, for all intents and purposes, captured by industry, literally in bed in hotel rooms with them. And so even if we were to make these changes in the laws and the regulations in Washington, what specifically could the could Interior do to change that mindset in Louisiana, in Alaska, the regional offices that are making these actual calls with regard to environmental review and, and uh, safety precautions? We have to be able to pay as well as industry pays. Uh, we have to provide a, a, a workplace that is better than industry. Uh, we have to ensure that there's ethics and training of these folks. Um, there are, there, this, is, this is not an unusual challenge for the federal government, but, there, but we have shown in other areas of the federal government that it can be done with a concentrated effort. There is a, 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 it is tricky. Um, our inspector general talks about the fact that in Louisiana, a lot of these folks grow up together and they're friends together, and they, uh, so it's, it, it's hard. That's why we have to have a separate safety and enforcement culture apart from the sort of permitting and leasing culture. We need, we need the cops on the beat. We need people to define their success by being strong enforcers. And that's going to mean that you're not going to go to bed uh, with this person or otherwise uh, necessarily be the most popular person at the town picnic. On that note. <laughs> Next question. Quick comment, Alma Robinson, class of 75. I'm also the director of California Lawyers for the Arts, and we initiated a dialogue on arts and environment. And every time I hear the word culture and values, I want to encourage you to reach out to the humanists and the arts people who are really generating uh, big conversations that are for the general public about how we perceive these issues of reclamation, restoration, conservation, so on. And perhaps you can even reach across the, the, um, the street to the National Endowment for the Arts and the Humanities and get them involved in this conversation. Uh, so with that said, I just wanted to mention a family friend who died recently, uh, Matthew Simmons, who was very much committed toward ocean energy, and I haven't heard ocean energy today. Wondered if anybody had any thoughts about that. Our mayor in San Francisco is also fond of that idea. Okay, anyone quickly want to talk about ocean energy? I'll just say, clearly offshore wind is a form of ocean energy, but you're talking about waves and tides and currents. And it, it, it's got promise. Uh, an increasing amount of research is being done, uh, some here, even more in other countries. So I think uh, it's, it's got potential. And, and the, new, the new agency that David put together, the old MMS, one of its duties is, in fact, to begin permitting those kinds of facilities. So um, like so many of these technologies, we've got an opportunity there. The good news, though, is there's a lot of things here and now today that we could be taking much greater advantage of. Okay. Final question. I'm interested in uh, the view that David expressed uh, that basically came to it, it might be necessary for our government to ramp itself up to the same level of expertise as industry. And I, I thought I understood that you pretty much subscribe to that, but also that a lot of the uh, public seem to re respond to that, seem to be positive about that. And I can't help, I can't, first of all, I can't help but agreeing with the concept that we can't trust these guys, so we've got to be more capable of watching them. Uh, but at the same time, I wonder what it will cost us to get up there and to stay up there year after year. But more important, is there something special about deep water drilling? Or are there hundreds or even thousands of other industries where the same concept would be applicable? And, uh, and, and then where are we in terms of uh, prioritizing uh, all of the businesses that, that government is going to become a big expert at and, and how much is it going to cost us? Uh, 12 seconds. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't speak to, uh, to, to the rest of the industry writ large, but I think there are ways for the government in, a, uh, economical, uh, uh, in an economic, uh, economical way to do this. And, and the, what we're talking about with our Ocean Energy Safety Institute is a, is a good way to do it. We, we spend tens of millions of dollars a year across the government 
uh, in this area generally, but it's not prioritized, aggregated into sort of a center of excellence that also brings in the tens of millions of dollars that industry uses. You could imagine putting this institute together with money that is already being spent and providing the, 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 the laboratory for government folks to work through uh, this institute, for industry folks to work through, so that uh, without, uh, you know, without a great amount of incremental effort, you end up with the, a great expertise in the federal uh, government. And there, our initial discussions with industry and with NGOs are very positive about that. Uh, this is something we've been talking a lot with Stephen Chu of the Department of Energy. We have great resources in our national labs, for example. They do a lot of this kind of thing with industry. We did it with the semiconductor industry with Semitech. There are some, there are some cool things to be done, and, and we have to be smart about it because you're right. Uh, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, and we have to be efficient. Do you have any guesses as to how many in other industries would have the same situation that we ought to change our philosophy of regulation so that government knows as much about it as, as the industry, so there could be thousands, right? Well, I uh, could be, I don't know, uh, but uh, so, some, some high-risk industries, I think, are already doing this. Nuclear is a good example, Dan mentioned it. Uh, I, I, I think the, 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 uh, the, the number of high-risk industries is, is, is not so overpowering that we can't tackle it. So let me just spend one more minute with the, uh, with the panel. What I'd like to do is just give each of the panelists one final opportunity to say something. And in particular, I want them within 20 words or less to tell us what is the most important lesson that we should remember uh, from the uh, BP oil spill. So Debbie, the most important lesson that we should the go first. home with. <laughs> yep, 20 words or less. 20 words. <laughs> Well, I, I would just say this last point that we're talking about to me what is the most important thing is how does government um, effectively go out there and keep up with technologies and industries. I mean, the shocking thing was when they were trying to cap the well down there, hearing experts say it's harder to do it here than on the moon, right? And it's harder to do something at, at this depth than on the moon, and so how do we as a society through our government agencies um, effectively do that kind of regulation. It's way more than 20 seconds. But more than 20 words, words, but still quite pithy, so Meg. <laughs> I think the, the biggest lesson is one that we probably haven't even, um, we don't know yet. Uh, the scientific community is very concerned about the potential impacts from the response effort. And just to give you an example, the diversion of fresh water into the wetlands, um, largest expanse of wetlands in the lower 48, uh, has uh, had dramatic effects on many of the species and organisms that are endemic to that area. The oyster beds are a particular focal point. Um, they're, it's the log uh, largest stretch of uh, natural oyster beds. It's a huge economic driver for the area. It's absolutely essential for shoreline protection, and many of those oyster beds are dead right now, and we don't know if they're gonna come back. Okay, Dan. 17 words. <laughs> oh, that's Excellent. Two. Okay, okay wait. I'm gonna keep track. All right. <laughs> Make a national commitment to building a clean energy economy through an integrated approach to technology, policy, and finance. And Excellent, okay. <laughs> David. Uh, Government oversight and regulation of dangerous activities matters, and we must invest and support it. Okay. So I hope that all of you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did, and I hope you'll join me in thanking the panel. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.